98, 99, walking into the clubs, and there's literally not another Arab in sight, you know? Not a single person. The fact that people are using what you said on stage to either create a business out of, create TikToks, create videos, um, T-shirts, or what have you, that tells you like, oh, I'm doing something very powerful here. And the makeup artists are like, Mo, you look just so cool. I'm not gonna lie. You look, that was the coolest entrance ever. And I looked around, there's like this $300 million, you know, movie. I'm just looking around like, you know what? Yeah, I think we made it. You know what I mean? Like that's, that was, that was, that was probably one of those moments. This is an empire. Stories of exceptional Arabs around the world and their journey to the top. Mo, uh, obviously it's well known that you came to this country as a refugee and for, for the purposes of this podcast, we know a lot about your background and how you came from Kuwait. But I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about um, when you arrived to Houston as a refugee, if, if when you think of that moment, if you have a particular memory that comes to mind um, uh, and, I, and you're smiling, so I guess you already know the answer. I mean, it's... it's um... It's a lot, but I just remember just being fish out of water here. You know, I just remember that when we first got here, it was like two days before Halloween and I've never heard about what Halloween was. I didn't, nobody even like told me like, oh, Halloween's coming. FYI, people are going to be dressed like psychopaths, you know, like nobody ever said anything. And then they're like two days later, everybody was just walking around like <laughs> zombies and just looking crazy. And I was just mortified. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then I was like, what is going on? I'm like nine years old. It just, it was a lot. <laughs> It was a lot to take in, but um, yeah, I mean, that's like one of the funny things that happened. But when I first got here, it was obviously like a big learning curve. I was uh, I was uh, nine years old. I was mad. I was confused. I, you know, had a lot of questions, but, but that was like the big thing when I first got here. <laughs> I was like getting used to uh, American culture, understanding Western culture, and just kind of you know, connecting the dots that way and understanding it. So that was, that was a big, big deal. And it went on for a while. You know, there was a lot of catching up to do as far as West. Or even when I decided to be a stand-up comedian, I didn't know the history of stand-up. I didn't know, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the great comedians that came before me and, and what they did and how they influenced culture here in America. So there was a lot of catching up period to do. So, um, yeah, it was a big learning curve and I made a, I made a fool of myself a few times in school. <laughs> it was just part of the process. There was a point where you stopped going to school, I read, and you kind of became a little bit of a rebel and, and your teacher made a deal with you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I was uh, 14. It was right when my dad passed away, Led Hamo. And I just quit at that point. You know, it was just five years of trying to assimilate at that point and, and working really hard to fit in and, and making, making great friends, though, that I still have to this day. Um, but it was just like the last straw for me. Um, I just, I just kind of like quit, just quit everything. I just, um, I just stopped going to school. I just stopped. <laughs> I was like a little grown man. You know, I started working when I was like 12 years old and under the table. And I just was, I just like, I just gave up in that moment. I just stopped going to school and, and I was going to baseball games. I was like, Fer have you ever seen that movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off? <laughs> I was yeah, like, that. Yeah. you should check it out. If you haven't seen it, whoever's listening, you should check it out. But it's like that. I was living like that the whole time. I was just going to baseball games, sitting at the, you know, first baseline on like great seats. I was selling like fake watches uh, to, to, to people in the neighborhood, uh, mostly, you know, guys that were kind of like in a, my similar situation that stopped going to school as well. They were making money. God knows how, but I never asked. I just would just sell all these like sunglasses and watches. I found the wholesale district through my dad before he passed away and, and um, figured you can get like merchandise through there and then you could flip it. And so that's what I was doing. I was like, oh, I'm making good money. I'm going to be a comedian anyway. Like, why do I need to go to school? And, and um, I found, honestly, I found American school 
uh, to be kind of like a joke ever since I got here. It was not really demanding of you. It wasn't really challenging. And, and, um, and I just didn't really care about it. It was just like, all, all it is is like memorization and regurgitating the text when the test came along and I just didn't really respect it. And, and I was just going through a lot emotionally. I was just, I just left. I was just living my best life. <laughs> uh, and then my teacher, my English teacher, Mrs. Reed uh, and Mrs. Broderick in ninth grade, Mrs. Reed in particular walked up to me and she said, how would your father feel if you don't graduate? Which would be Faliha, man. If you don't graduate, it's like a huge Faliha. Like it would be horrible. Yeah. A yeah, big scandal for those that don't speak Arabic. It would be a big, big scandal. My family, I'm the youngest. I'm the only one. Everybody else has graduated, has multiple degrees, and and it would just be a terrible thing. And I was like, oh, my God, it would be horrible. And she goes, don't you want to be a comedian? I was like, yeah, because I made it really well known. I would tell everybody, I'm going to be a comedian. I'm, I'm going to do stand-up comedy, blah, blah, blah. That's what I was going to do. And everybody was just like. A lot of pressure on yourself. <laughs> I just knew, I just knew, you know, um, and I just kept saying it. And I figured if I kept saying it, then something would happen. And it did. And so my teacher, uh, she said, she made a deal with me. She goes, if you can go up in front of the class and um, for extra credit, if you can recite a monologue from Shakespeare, since it's English class, I will let you do stand up in front of the class. I was like, it's a no-brainer. She goes, I'll give you extra credit and um, help you make up the assignments so you can pass this class at least. But the deal is you can't skip and you can't skip any other classes. And if I find out you skip, I'm going to give you the same grade you have now. And I'm going to basically like, I'm going to fail you. I'm going to just like, you broke our pact and I'm going to take it all from you. I was like, this is a no-brainer. I just went up in front of the class. And I was like, can I just do this monologue from Hamlet right now? And she was just like, yeah. I was like, does it have to be like serious? Can I just make it funny in front of the class? She goes, yeah, it'd be able to go for it. I was like, can I do it now? She's like, yeah, sure. I was like, okay. So I just went up in front of the class to be or not to be. And I just like riffed, you know, playing with it and just playing with the text. And the whole class was like laughing like crazy. And I was hooked. I was like, oh man, Mrs. Reed, can I come in tomorrow and do some stand up? She was like, yeah, you can, absolutely. So I came in the next day and I did some stand up. First of all, I realized when I went home, I was like, I have no material. I got to write something ASAP. So I went in front of the class the next day and did some stand up that I riffed on and and <clears throat> it killed and kids were laughing and then I went on for a while, a few weeks, and then my teacher took me to the theater arts department, like, hey man, this kid's been doing like original stand up and all these accents and stuff. I think he belongs in theater. And um she took me to Lugene Kreisner, who was a theater arts teacher at that time. She goes, uh she goes, Okay, like, sure come audition for something. And I was too scared. I was like, oh man, audition. I don't know. It was right. And this, so I, the next year I went in and auditioned and I made it. And then next thing you know, like six months later, I was like lead, getting lead roles, all the lead roles in theater. Um, and yeah, and the rest is kind of history. And I was sneaking away and doing stand up whenever I could. I was too young to get into the clubs uh, and they were like, well, your mom has to bring you or your parent has to bring you. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to tell my mom to bring me to a comedy club where there's like liquor everywhere and all kinds of stuff. Like my mom would never do that. She, all she hears is club. I'm like, my son's just going to be <laughs> a whore. That's what he's going to be. He's gonna be <laughs> so it didn't work out. So my friend Nick, he was the one that would sneak me to the comedy clubs. When I was 17, he took me to the comedy club and he was like, Mo, are you ready? This is the first day of the rest of your life. And he was being corny, but funny, but also serious. But he was right. He was absolutely right. So that's how I got into the comedy club scene. I showed up to the Houston Funniest Person competition. I ended up making it through like the first pass. I didn't have any material. So, but it was like amazing that I even made a wild card. And then the next year I was in the finals of that contest. Um, and then I realized, you know, comedians shouldn't be in competition with each other. They should be just outworking each other, you know, just trying to get as many hours as you can on stage. And, and that's what I did. And comedians would just snatch me up. Uh, headliners would just be like, hey, man, you want to come open for me? You want to come feature for me? And that lasted about like 
maybe six months before they were like, okay, you need to go do your own thing now. You know, you need to just go away <laughs> because I was just, I was, you know, I was meant to be a headliner, you know, that's what I am. So I never like featured, never had like a middle spot or anything like that, but I hosted for a little while and I would open for these comedians for a little bit. And then, um, yeah, I went on the journey from there. Do you remember any of your best jokes from back then? Like even from your school days? From my school days? Um, from my school days, I would just do, like, I would do impressions of, like, delivery, pizza delivery drivers and and then the person's reaction to that delivery. And then, uh, but I don't remember the rest, to be honest. It was just, like, a lot of riffing. And then, oh, and then what I would do is I would um, I would put on, like, a super tight sports coat and I would roast the kids in class as Chris Farley. So that's mostly what I would do. Um, but then when I got into the clubs, you had to have stand, you had to have material. So I would just go and write and <clears throat> come back with the next day, you know, very next day with some jokes and, and do them. Yeah, yeah. But I do remember all those jokes and some of them, you know, need to go away, but some of them are great. Some of them ended up, you know, making the cut many years later, but yeah, I do. I do remember them. Absolutely. Is your pro? Is your process of writing jokes, is your creative process very similar to what it was when you were younger? Like, how has it developed? Um, it has, of course, is, you know, I have many hours under my belt. So now I could just, I just do things a little bit differently. But it is very similar uh, in the sense that I just think about it and I just take it on stage. I don't necessarily like write things out. Um, I'll write the concepts out, but... I have to have an audience present um, to do what I do. It's like, it's very difficult to do it without an audience. I mean, like, I know a joke like, oh, man, that's going to kill. That's going to be great. Can't wait to do it for an audience. I don't need someone to tell me, like, oh, is that going to work? I don't need, like, the audience to gauge how it is. <clears throat> that's not really why I need the audience is they inspire me. The audience reaction usually will elicit a thought from me that otherwise I wouldn't have had without them being present. It's like them laughing a little bit or even chuckling a little bit at the initial setup will inspire a thought process that I haven't had before. And I think it has to do with pressure. Like I operate best under pressure. Like if there's no stakes, I'm like bored. And that works with all facets of my life. It could be like a silly game between me and my friend. Like I was just, I was just doing shows with Chappelle in, in Maryland, um, right outside of DC in this, uh, casino. We had four shows there. And then a friend of mine, Joe works for Dave, um, in his, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter what he does, but we were leaving and we saw a basketball goal and there was like two large buckets of footballs next to it. And we just started this game. We're like, let's throw these footballs and see who can make the most, you know, who can get the 10 first into a basketball hoop from like 25 yards away. We're like, okay. And then he would be up and it would be the last ball. I beat him two times in a row, two different days. It was on the last ball. Like it was, uh, he was up nine, seven. And I was just like, initially I was up like by four and I just got bored and I just started missing. And then the stakes became like, you're going to lose. And there was like, and then I hit three in a row and I beat him on the last ball. So that's just like, it's a metaphor for my life. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people that I work with professionally in making television or stand up or in the producing world, don't really understand, and they're, I guess they're starting to understand, like my background comes with reacting under pressure all the time. My whole life has been that way. Is your back's against the wall, what are you gonna do? And then you figure it out, and next thing you know, you're very successful. And I, and I truly operate best that way. Like, like undoubtedly. <laughs> There's just too many situations to show that, that like I am, I need to always be that way. Like I need to have some kind of pressure or else I get bored. Like it's just the way yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you Mo, like 
you know, a lot of Arab Americans, I think, either choose um, to really like, especially creatives, like either lean into their Arabness or lean out of it and try and assimilate and try and just be like everyone else and, and go that route. You very much have chosen a route where you're leaning into your background, you're leaning into the fact that you're Arab American. And, and I wonder if that's a conscious decision or, or somehow, you know, yeah, you were put in that box or like, how did that, how did you make that decision? Well, I, I was very conscious of it ever since I was a little kid. Um, when I would show up to the comedy clubs and I realized, like, I'm the only one here. There's nobody else like me. Like, literally. There was not a single... I'm talking about, like, 99, you know, 98, 99, walking into the clubs. And there's literally not another Arab in sight, you know? Not a single person. Not even a... Not, yeah, I don't even remember being like there was a Muslim person around doing stand up close to me if they weren't even Arab. So I realized that stand up is a part of like influencing culture and our culture did not exist. I was just like, wow. Well, if there's nobody else like me, might as well talk about the stuff that I know and the stuff that. The, where I come from, absolutely, I leaned into it. I think the people that don't lean into it are idiots, personally. I think they're trying to be something that they're not. And it's something like you're denying who you are. And there was a lot of comedians that would just like almost judge me for leaning into it. And now those comedians are leaning into it because it's, it's a means of success potentially for them. Where for me, it was always about just being authentic to myself and authentic to my heritage and where I come from. But that's not all I talk about. It's all really universal. I mean, and then 9-11 happened and I'm touring the South as myself, as my authentic self. You know how hard that is? You know how much guts it takes to like travel the South by yourself in a car in these little hole in the walls to have all this like, prejudice against you while you're doing that, you know, it was extremely difficult. And then while everybody's telling you, you're not going to make it, you can't do it. It's impossible. What are you talking about? You're, you know, focus on something else. Um, you know, it takes a lot of guts to do that. It takes a lot of belief in your dream and your, in your like vision for you to pull that off. And I'd always knew that Hollywood needed to catch up and whenever they catch up, I'll be here and not only be here, but I'll be the best at it because I've been working on it so long. So, and it's not about like, oh, can you do this? I could talk about anything I want. I can make anything funny. Like literally, you can do anything. Just give me a subject and I'll take it on stage and make it interesting or make it funny in some capacity. That's not, that's not the issue, but it's truly into like being authentic to myself was always the, always uh, the goal. You know, like, what a tragedy would it be that I made it off of pretending I was something that I'm not? Boy, that would really just be gut-wrenching. <laughs> so that was always the purpose. And I knew that there was a gap, and I knew, like, hey, comedians influence culture, so I want to influence culture. I see my stuff all the time. People message me, like, people stealing your stuff and doing it or remixing it, and, and um, you know, this is my material that I wrote, and... Um, that's on, you know, Netflix and on, or on Amazon or something else that, that'll just end up in people's stuff. I mean, there's falafel tacos on menus. There's people that have made a whole restaurant off of it. You know, like this is, this is what I do. And that is like the barometer of success to me. It's like, how have you influenced the culture and the fact that people are using what you said on stage to either create a business out of, create TikToks, create videos, um, T-shirts or what have you that tells you like, oh, I'm doing something very powerful here to where it's truly influencing culture. And that's what I'm thinking about. And that's what I, that's what I view as like success. 
you know, all the other stuff that gets the new, that gets in the news and, and what have you, the streets are not talking about that. People are not talking about that. You're not influencing people that way. But when I released Muhammad in Texas, and then like a week later, my mom gets a WhatsApp video of me and they don't even know that's my mom. Crazy. Or if my aunt from our village of like 2000 people forwards her a video of me of the encore whoosh, boy, I've done something there. Or if my cousin calls me up, is like, man, I'm sitting in a random coffee shop and I'm man, and people are saying your name. Oof, man, I've done something there. That's what I think about. I got chills right now. Like that makes me emotional. It's like, man, the ride has been so heavy and so long that, man, it just makes me feel so good that I'm able to like put my stamp on things. And now all these, you know, I call them kids. Or I'm still very young, you know, like in comparison um, to some of these kids. Like I'm talking about like kids and like stand up. They're doing bits that I did like 20 years ago. You know what I mean? Like I'm so ahead of it. It's insane. It's just I'm so ahead. And so I look at it and I'm like, oh, that's cute. You know what I mean? Like then and also it's very sweet to see that that they are. um that there is so many out there now and they are trying and we are going to influence culture and be a part of, you know, global culture and, and Western culture and influencing it in a way where it's positive and showing us in a different light. So, yeah, is that a good enough answer? <laughs> it's a like great so answer. Uh, no, not at all. I think that's, that's part of the, I mean, um, when you talk about success and influencing culture, I think it's also like so valuable to see representation. I remember still living in Beirut like six years ago and getting WhatsApp videos of your bit about the getting, you know, the Germans getting your Palestinian past like document. And like, well, I remember that. I remember it so well because we all, all of us passed it along. And back then, I mean, that was a long time ago, obviously now. And I was still in Beirut. And so, yeah. And then I, you know you're ever you are everywhere now and you are at the forefront of really our representation in hollywood and that no one has done it like like you have really no one has you're you're at the forefront of that and we're all we're all in, indebted to you it's true we're oh, all man. indebted to you so i just it's wonder crazy. mo like how, but it's true it's a thousand percent genuine and true my whole and body's in like wonder- chills. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I just wonder how you do it. Like, how do you have, like, where did you get, like, first of all, Arabs are really fucking judgy, you know, like yeah. so judgy, not only in the family unit, but the outer, like everyone is so overtly judgmental, I think in our culture as well. Like, it's a great thing. There's a lot of passion, but, but I just wonder, like, how do you still, how do you continue to do that? How do you take a, get in your car and go to the South after nine 11? Are you kidding me? Like, that is nuts. Like, where did you get that from? Um, I just really like knew in my core, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, like, and the more people said that I couldn't do it, the more I had to do it. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I just, um, you know, there was just, I don't know. I can't describe it. It was just like, I knew and nobody else knew, you know, like I know I'm going to make it and I'm go. this is what I'm intended to do. You don't understand. That's okay. Because you're not supposed to, but I do. Um, and that's it. And it sucks. And there was tears. There was like, exhaustion there's all of it but i knew and nobody else did like i would be in the comedy club at the last stop uh when i was like maybe 19 years old and there's this guy that ran it at that point and he was uh, and there was like maybe five six comedians in that room and he was a real jerk you know this this guy he although he was doing a lot for the club um, for the like local comedy scene, he really didn't know how to curate local talent. He didn't really know how to understand 
how to motivate. It was all about like, he started adopting like LA rules. Well, you got to be at the club if you want to go up at the club. I'm like, well, I'm going on the road already. I'm doing like 30 minutes to an hour on the road. Like that's way better than doing three to five minutes on an open mic at two o'clock in the morning in front of three people for me to get a chance to go up. Like, fuck you, man. Like, this is not the way to do it. And so I would just go on the road. And when I came back, and I remember I was at the club. I was trying to hang out whenever I had time so I can get into this club because it is a hot club, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting in this room, the, the main room, and there was like six other comedians in the room. And he goes, and this guy goes, somebody in this room is going to make it. I could tell you that. And I remember sitting there, I'm like, yeah, you idiot, it's me. And I was right, you know, like I am, <laughs> I was that guy, but he didn't have that. Um, he didn't know how to curate young talent. He didn't know how to like truly care about that. He was like, he had his own issues and, and that's fine. But that's the, I'm just trying to illustrate like how much I believed in myself and what I knew in the core of my being, like, this is what I'm supposed to do. So the judgment was hard. All that stuff was really, really difficult. I would perform. And then when I, and then when it started being like a thing within our communities, like within fundraisers or within these like events that they would have, and they realized that they needed entertainment and I would show up and I would like demolish. They'd be like, oh, oh, okay. And then they would just try to use you like crazy. <laughs> like I never got, and that's, that's like the sad part is I like unplugged from my local community for a bit because it was always like, hey, can you go up on stage and do a little bit? Hey, can you go up on, it's like, hey man, I'm not a clown. Like I'm not a magician. I'm not a monkey. Like I'm not going to go up there and be like, yeah, here it is. Bing. You know, like that's not how this works. And I had to like unplug and I realized the the more I unplug, the better it is for my community. I need to excel at where I am uh, in the mainstream and do that. And I just need to let them figure it out and I'll help them as much as possible when I can. Otherwise, I don't owe anybody anything except myself and my family. I really even, <clears throat> tech, some people will tell you, you don't even owe anything to your family, but I, that's, you know, we can't, I can't do that. Like, it's always about my family to me. You know, it's always about my lineage, it's always about like doing that justice and and having something there that's proud of. And even like releasing Muhammad in Texas and speaking, like having such strong language in there was terrifying for me to put it out. But if you get it, you get it. You get why I did it. But if you don't get it, then you might think that I'm a crazy person or somebody who's like lost their way. But that's not the case at all. It was very deliberate and it was really really about like showcasing not only like the depth of Arabic language, but it's, you know, I don't want to have to explain it too much or else the joke gets lost, but you know, you either get it or you don't basically, but you can't, and you have to be honest with yourself. Like some people get into business and I see it and they're like, they don't belong here. I'm like you stink. Like you're never going to get good or you don't really have the purpose to like be a stand up comedian. You just want to be famous. You just want to be popular. You just want attention. You don't really love the art form. You're just doing stand-up so you can get an acting job. Where for me, it's like everything that I get outside of stand-up is to do this thing more, which is stand-up. So it's that's where it is. And, and to write and to direct and to do all that, I'm like, I'm great at all of it. I know I am. Like, I can do it. So, and I'm doing it now. So it's it just feels really good to... Um, to be able to do these things and start telling these stories and, and to get into it. And we're just barely scratching the surface now. Like there is so much to come. Inshallah. Like I'm very, very excited to, to put it all out there before I'm gone from this place. Um, uh, you do do it all right now. You're writing, you're directing, you're coming out with a movie, you're doing stand up. You have this like extensive deal with Netflix. Um, where, like, how do you actually find uh, sanity in everything? And and then I also want to ask, like, what parts of you are you discovering that are surprising you on a personal level, like that you didn't think that you could do, that you can do, or parts of you that you're discovering along the way? I love that. I love, you know, 
I realized that I really, really enjoy making television, uh, sitcom. I really enjoyed it. One of the hardest things I've ever done for sure. Um, but it also came really easy for me. I felt specifically like in the pre-production phase and in the production time. And again, back, back against the wall type situation. It was like, I, it was great. And I really enjoyed the post-production of it all, like putting it together, you know, like it's hard to express your vision. And then when you get into the editing room and you start putting it together and people go, oh, okay. That feels like a relief. I don't know to you like, and, and just like the collaboration of it all. I really enjoy it. I really enjoy the back and forth and figuring it out and molding the show to what the vision is and staying true to that. That was so much fun. Like I thought I'd hate it to be honest, like in editing for like hours and hours and hours, <laughs> but it was like one of the most rewarding parts of it. Um, yeah, it was just like a lot of fun. What was the last part of the question? Sorry. Well, on a personal note, if there are things that you've learned about yourself that are surprising you or, or elements of you that you're. I guess like dramatic acting, maybe like, like the dramatic side of things. Like, um, I don't know how much of it is really acting when, when you're doing something that's so personal as well, but, uh, but just having like the timing for it and understanding like to be in your body and to like be present for something that's so serious that's probably like it's probably one of the most surprising things to me i was just like oh okay we can do that too that's cool <laughs> you know like that's we can we can be really personal and vulnerable in this situation and tell a story that way i'm like oh. it's so nerve-wracking because you leave something that's so serious and then you look around and all the production people are like that just happened we didn't know mo could do that i'm like i didn't know i could do that <laughs> well i knew i could do it but i didn't know i could do it you know it was one of those things like and to see everybody emotional and feeling it with you too is like very powerful you're like oh man we're doing something special here you know we're doing something very very special and unique but yeah i think that's it i think the whole process of even like the post production process and going through that that's all like surprising too well not surprising but it's just like I didn't know I was, I think the surprising part is I didn't know I was going to enjoy it so much. Do you remember, since we have some time, do you remember your, like when you felt like, oh, I, I made it? Like, did you, do you remember that breakthrough moment or that? Yeah. I still don't that feel was? that way. I still don't feel that way. Come on. <laughs> no, one lie. I swear to God, I don't feel that way at all. I don't feel that way. When you're on stage, with Dave Chappelle, you don't feel like, you know, uh, or like you're, doing you know when you're on drama or when you're you have this amazing special on netflix and um mm, no i don't feel like i made it like i i definitely know that i'm working with like yeah i guess like doing the biggest venues in the world yeah like i get working with that stuff definitely feels like you're in the majors for sure like i'm not saying that i'm not but there's just like so much to give there's so much still in the bank that I haven't shared. So I just don't feel comfortable. And maybe like, maybe like, I feel like, oh, I made it equals being comfortable and I'm not comfortable. Does that make sense? Like, I think the moment that I become comfortable, I become lazy and then, then, and then it's over. Like, what's the point? Like, there's still so much to do. Like, there's still so much to do and so much to talk about and put out there. So, but I definitely feel like I'm, you know, now I'm in the starting lineup in the majors and I'm, and I'm hitting, you know, I'm hitting home runs and I'm, and I'm playing great ball. Like, that's how I feel. Um, but I'm just like too close to it. You know, like I forget all the time that I'm doing this stuff. Like I forget all the time. I'm always like, you know, around my, my friends I grew up with and like, you know, they don't never let me slide that way. You know, like, Oh, it was a big deal. You know, never, it's nothing like that. It's just, sometimes I forget, like I genuinely like forget and people will stare from a distance and I'm like, the fuck are you looking at man? And I was like, Oh yeah, I did the thing. I did that thing on TV and they just like, and I forget all the time, but I do, but I am aware of course that I'm like in a special you know, 
league now. I'm in the majors and I'm doing things on a very big level. And obviously, like, I appreciate that. I am like, have a lot of gratitude towards that. And I just want to execute and I want to keep building. But yeah, I don't have a moment like, I made it, you know, like, I, this is what it is, baby. Look at me, you know, like, nothing that hasn't come out yet. I don't know if necessarily it will, because it's just about like creating more and more and more. But definitely like having those moments where I'm, it's like Royal Albert Hall and it's you and, and John Stewart and Chappelle, like doing shows there and, you know, like four nights or just touring Europe together. And you're just like, oh man, this is the stuff. Or, or like, you know, it was like 10 days ago or something like Fallon, Black Thought, uh, Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, myself, all like shared a stage together. And it was just like, yeah, that was dope. It was really dope. It was just a special night. You know, it was a really special night. So yeah, I, I'm very grateful for that. I think also, cause it took me, um, it took so much work, so many years of like hard, hard work and grind that I'm not like the, I'm not trying to celebrate too soon. You gotta, this, you gotta, you gotta, I'm enjoying the moments. I'm like there for them. I'm embracing them. I love them, but I see it as just like, I'm just hanging out with my friends and just doing this thing on like the highest level possible, which is very exciting. And I feel like I'm just getting started. So it's hard to be like, yeah, I made it. But there's a few moments where you're just like, mm. I even said it on Colbert, right? I said, mama, we made it. You know, it was just, but I felt like that was like the start of something. And it was, it was definitely like the start of something. Um, but yeah, but please, I hope nobody watching this. I'm like, well, oh, he's full of shit. No, I do appreciate what I'm doing. And I think it's dope. And I think, I think the moment, let me answer this. And I think the moment where I felt like, oh man, like we really, I'm really like, we are doing this is when I pulled up on my motorcycle in full, uh, full costume where I was filming black Adam in Atlanta, right up to the, right up to set. It was like a cigarette in my mouth, <laughs> hanging out and just, bling, 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 bling. I just pull up right to set and it's this huge set. And there's the rock in full costume, you know, looks, he's the rock. He looks spectacular in that damn thing. It's like the best costume ever that I've seen in a superhero. Honestly, like, I'm no, not just because I'm in the movie. It's just fact. Okay. This guy <laughs> looks legendary in this outfit and you're just walking up on a motorcycle. I mean, drive rolling up on a motorcycle like that with a cigarette in your mouth and, and the makeup artists are like, Mo, you look just so cool. I'm not going to lie. You look, that was the coolest entrance ever. And I looked around, there's like this $300 million, you know, movie. I'm just looking around like, you know what? Yeah, I think we made it. You know what I mean? Like that's, that was, that was, that was probably one of those moments, but I'm always in my body too much. And I'm always like a chip on my shoulder type of dude. And I need to like snap out of that a little bit. I'm sure. Cause I remember I was mm -hmm. with Chappelle and, and, um, in California, we're in Santa Monica and I'm driving and, and, uh, and I'm telling them like, yeah, I need to do this and I need to do that. Da, da, da. And I'm just like, just really like have this energy. Like I need to do more and this is what it is. It's got to get better. And, and Dave looks at me and goes, um, you're driving Dave Chappelle's Porsche sitting drive, you know, while Dave Chappelle's sitting next to you. I think things are going fine. Mo. I think things are going <laughs> fine. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you're right. I never really thought about it that way. You're right. Things are going fine. It was just a really funny moment where I was just like, and I, and I think that's what it is. It's just like having this fight in you all the time. And, and it comes from being displaced and it comes to, you know, landing in a place where most people don't understand and, and having to fight through like so many, so many, um, not fight through, but just like really, really, just grind through so much uh, misunderstanding and, and, and it's just like, you just always, I think I always feel like I got to do more. I need to go. I need to don't get comfortable. You know, I think that's like the immigrant mentality. You got to outwork everybody, you know? And I think that's what it is, but yeah, I have a lot of gratitude. It's so dope. It feels great. I feel like relieved because I was right. You know, to keep pursuing it. <laughs> <laughs> we 
would it be like the worst if I'm still doing open mics trying to make it? Like, <laughs> no way. No way. That would yeah. be horrible. I mean, what's great about you also is that I think you have, even in, even in your comedy, you have a lot of empathy. Like I remember the Netflix special where at the end you talk about your neighbor in Houston and you talk about kind of the division in this country and trying to amplify empathy and kindness. Mm -hmm. And I, I know Ch Chappelle does that a little bit as well, but that's one of my other favorite things about you is that you, you are constantly trying to promote empathy. Um, with people that look different than you, maybe trying to, you know, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's really important. It's just um, from where I grew up, right? And and also, like, I just can't stand how the media always frames it as A against B and then C against D. It's like, yo, this is bullshit. You know, it's just not the way it is. Out here in the streets, it's not like that, you know. Out here with your neighbors, it's just not like that. So just, it just is so incredibly frustrating. Um, and so it just like putting out an example of that was really important to me, just to to kind of nip some of that away. And and um, yeah, that it's, I think it's really important. And it's just it's natural. And that part, by the way, in the special was spontaneous. I had it in my head. I didn't know what I was going to do or say in which direction it was going to go. I had some idea, and then I changed it in the middle of the performance. So while we were filming, so that's just the way it did. It just happened. So it was just very natural, and and it was honest, and that's the way it is. And and I loved it. And they sent me Scott and his and his wife sent me a picture of them together, and they watched the special. It was really cute. It was so cute. Yeah, I love them. I love them. They they. They were they're fan, they were fantastic neighbors, not my neighbors anymore because I moved, but they were like amazing and they still were still in touch, you know, and they're always going to be in my life. And, and people need to know like a Muhammad could be next door to Redneck Scott and have a phenomenal relationship and maybe have more things in common than you think. You know, Thank so like when you go into yeah. his backyard and he's like slaughtering a deer, I'm like, well, I remember when I walked in on my uncle doing that. You know what I mean? Like, do but not a deer, but it was a lamb. You know, like, I, it was just like, well, I've seen this before. It's just like, culturally, there's things that are actually make us a lot closer versus than what they're trying to always promote, which is, you know, division, which is really not accurate. That stuff is taught clearly. You know, a three yeah. or four year old or five year old that's racist, like, oh, your parents suck. You know what I mean? Like, it's obvious that you learn this. Um, and people are like, you know, unfortunately are, are, are a product of their environment. And that happens more often than not. So hopefully some of this stuff that, that some of this art that you could put out that can influence culture in a way and also just make you laugh and make you think in the best way possible. That's what it's about to me. Yeah. Last question, Mo, is... Oh. Anything else that you want to say that I haven't asked you? And also, like, what do you need from us as the Arabs in diaspora, your Arab community, your your fans? Support, you, you know, it's like support. Yeah. It's like share it with everybody, tell everybody, like, you know, this is all the work. This is all for you, you know, like that's really really what I want to to say here is like, this is all for you. This is literally all for you. And not only for you, but for your kids, 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 you know, like this is meant to, to, to open up doors for all of them and, and, and create some kind of stories for them that they can relate to and, and be a part of. And, and that's what I want. So you got to support that. You have to support that in a really big way and you got to push it because um, if I don't have that, then what's the point, you know? What's the point? Which I do. You know, I'm very blessed to have the support and and love. And I can see how people react to me. And it makes me feel like a little little baby. It makes me literally feel like a baby. It makes me feel like so loved and cared for. And it's just, I can't do it without the fans, you know? So what's the point of doing it if nobody can relate to it? So it's just like love. I uh, send love to everybody in all corners of the world. And just thank you so much for everything. That's it. Thank you, Mo. Thank you so much for doing this for us. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My, my pleasure. Yeah, take alfafia. I love you. Really. 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 Really.
I'll see you guys Thank soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, see you soon. I don't know. Take is there care. anybody else there? I said, see you guys soon. I said, hi to everyone. <laughs> just <Whoever's> me. <laughs> just you. Whoever.